Won't you pray with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I consider this, um, this message to be not a, uh, I consider it to be, I guess not a part two, maybe footnotes to the, to the sermon that was preached to you by the Reverend civil rights leader, modern day prophet among us, Justin J. Pearson. Thanks be to God for this church, the people in it, the power of the gospel that is among us and the witness to what God does, not just uh, within us, but among us, through us. Uh, what a testimony. I could throw this whole thing out and we would have had church already. Uh, and so I say, amen, amen, amen. Um, uh, you know, what's curious to me about uh, MLK Sunday uh, and the day that follows is that with each passing year, this weekend seems to become simultaneously more necessary and inspiring and infuriating all at the same time. And I know a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about. With our lives so enmeshed in social media, we get to hear everyone's thoughts on everything all of the time. And if I have to hear one more political representative who has run on a platform of white rage, all lives matter, pro-police state, trumped up, over the top, anti-critical race theory sentiment, quote MLK's I have a dream speech one more time. I'm going to hurl my entire computer, my phone, my Apple Watch, and any other device into the Charles River because they are good words that get distorted into what I want to call a what to think mentality, judged not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. They quote, in order to silence a conversation instead of have one. Why is the fact that I'm white relevant in regards to my power, my position, my choices, when King says not color of skin, but content of character. In fact, you pointing to my race in this situation makes what you're doing racism. And so allow me to be the one to teach you to be a better person in this scenario. This is a prime example of what happens when we're taught what to think and not how to think. Where set platitudes on what is good or what is bad get passed down to us, we hold on to them with everything we've got and then we just apply them, devoid of any context, history, or original intent to any situation we so choose for our benefit. This is what happens when what you're thinking mimics the movement of justice, but how it is that your thinking grips the chains of captivity ever more tightly around the wrists of God's people. I think the prophet Jeremiah says it like this, they treat the wound of my people carelessly, crying peace, peace, where there is no peace. Christians who are taught what to think are dangerous. That's it. That's the thesis of the sermon. Christians who are ta taught what to think, not how to think, are dangerous. To be taught what to think is to assume oneself to be an empty vessel, a follower and only that, one who requires knowledge from on high in order to live right 
and well. You were born in a vacuum as a clean slate. History and tradition don't matter. To be taught what to think is to be trained up with the desire for rigid understandings of who I am and how I'm meant to live and what I would do in any given scenario. To be taught what to think is to move through the world armed with an arsenal of virtues like loving one's neighbor and doing good works and preaching a gospel of love and liberation, but being confused, defensive, off-put, and even dismissive when the response to your actions is you're hurting me. Your theology and preaching and evangelistic actions, your policy decisions and your words from the pulpit are doing me and my people harm, spiritual and material harm. I sincerely mean it. When I ask the question, what are we doing here? Faith has been something that has been so repackaged and commodified over time that it's less of an expression of Christ's love or an orientation to the gospel. And it's more of an object that a person just hopes to acquire. Just tell me what to do. Just tell me what the rules are, what the practices are, so that I can get right and I can be good. Tell me what to think. If you've ever been to a union Bible study, you'll see that we unpack this all of the time. We are so ready for someone like me or Pastor Jay or Pastor Kyle to tell you that I, I found the answer in my study of ancient Hebrew texts to that question you had about the mystery of God or the meaning of life. But I am not the keeper of the mystery of God and the arbiter of the things of life. And when God spoke in the very beginning, God said, I will make humankind, not just PhD pastors and churchy folk and those in clerical garb and deep theological study. God said, I will make humankind in my image and will breathe my spirit of life upon them and within them and give them the capacity to see me, know me, feel me, experience me, which means that just as God actively participates in the things of creation, so too does creation get to actively participate in the things of God. I'm hooked on images of Jesus calling the first disciples. Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of paint this portrait of some of the disciples. They're, they're hanging out seaside lowly, uneducated fishermen, and it ends up being this like mysterious, powerful Jesus figure who kind of just walks up, tells a sermon here, throws a miracle there. And then we're, we inherit this picture of the disciples who just quite literally drop their nets. They don't say goodbye. They don't grab a coat. They don't stop by their house. They just kind of mi mindlessly drop everything, trail right after Jesus right then and there. It's how the story gets passed down to us. And it's so convenient for those who don't like it when we've got questions or doubts or hesitations or concerns within the church, as though the call to drop your nets and follow me is also the call to drop who you are in the process, your reason, your experience, your intuition. You know, metaphors only go so far in the Christian tradition. They're here to help us. They point toward the mystery of God. They help us to gain a small snapshot of the vast expanse that is the one who created us all. Maybe we are all sheep and God is the good shepherd, but we are not lemmings being mindlessly led to the slaughter. Every day I want Jesus a little bit more. And the strangest part about our task as Christians, not in the early church, but in the late, 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 late church is that the question we always have to ask is which Jesus? Who's Jesus? Because I can say with confidence that the January 6th insurrection Jesus is not my Jesus. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus, not my Jesus. Ghostly, condemning, purity culture Jesus, not my Jesus. What do we do when what we're told of our Jesus is that of love and liberation, but how it is that that vision of Jesus plays out in our lives and our churches is one that keeps us and the people around us in captivity. I am forever intrigued by Jesus first calling the disciples in the Gospel of John. 
because it's outlined just a little bit differently. A few of the disciples spot Jesus and recognize him for who he is immediately. They follow him out of curiosity and intrigue. And when Jesus catches on, he stops, he turns around to face them, and he asks them point blank, what are you looking for? What are you doing? Jesus is highlighting for the disciples their own agency and discernment in choosing to follow him. Tell me what you're doing here. Articulate it not just for me, but for yourself. And because the disciples are like all of us, they ask a what to think kind of question. Uh, uh, where are you staying? They want plain answers. They want Jesus to tell them what is going on so that they can know exactly where to go. And this is what I love about this rendering. Jesus does not explicitly tell them the what. The place isn't defined and outlined for them. Jesus takes their desire to participate in a what to think mentality and turns it into a how to think mentality. He says to them, come and see, come and see. Proximity to Christ, relationship to Christ will always change our worldly desires into God's desires. And when I say worldly desires, I'm not talking about chocolate or movies or sex or sleeping in. I'm talking about the desire to fall in line and follow the leader as a mode of staying safe and keeping the status quo. But God's desire is always for people. God's desire is always for people to be in relationship with creation and with one another. Come and see. Come and experience this with me, not behind me, Christ says. I'm not here to teach you what to think, but how to think, how to be. So do this with me. It's an entirely different and radical mode of thinking about discipleship than many of us have inherited or grown up with. A Jesus who does not trail us along or listen to us for the purpose of making us feel better, but for the purpose of collaborating with us in mission and ministry in the world. What is relationship? What is loving relationship if our vision of the divine companion is one who is a smug CEO patiently listening to our concerns but ultimately waiting to give us our next godly task? with me, not behind me, Jesus says. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Listen, I'm going to cut to the chase. It's actually no coincidence. This is the footnote to Justin. It's no coincidence that the same mental frameworks that lead to racist politicians piously quoting MLK and seeing no irony in it, and the mental frameworks that cause this toxic dissonance in our churches between what we're told to believe is true and how that actually plays out in our lives are the same mental frameworks. It's not a coincidence. This is the Sunday of all Sundays to just state plainly and clearly that European colonization in the new world, in this land on which we stand, did us no favors when it came to Christianity. White Christian settlers brought with them a gospel that justified the genocide of natives peoples on this soil in Massachusetts, the name of which is an Algonquin word. Look, white supremacy and Christianity have been so intricately braided throughout this 245 years of American history that it takes work 
for us to figure out when we're participating in what Christ has invited us to come and see. And when we've gotten totally lost in the chaos, following behind the footsteps of some imposter that most certainly is not the savior of the world, the powers that be, the powers that seek to harm us, want us to fall in line and say, just tell me what to think so that I can just be good and safe and set are among us. But God said, I have gifted you a gospel of life and resurrection to raise these dead things into new life and turn this messy world around. Do not take for granted union that the work you're doing to liberate your spiritual life, your prayer life, your scriptural life is directly related to the systems and structures and powers that dictate every other area of life. Decolonize the church, decolonize the world. Put differently, it might sound a bit like injustice Justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. When liberation is experienced in one place, liberation can be experienced in all places. Listen, God did not hover over the waters of the deep, speak into the void, liberate life into existence, breathe us into freedom, cultivate creation, sustain us in time and space, take on human flesh, touch down on the dirty, rocky, uneven, uncertain and soil as an innocent baby with a name and a mom and a face did not grow up struggle go to school learn make friends stumble heal preach teach sing laugh eat weep struggle through persecution did not die get back up on the third day with a story still to tell find his friends in the upper room speak of peace share a meal ascend to heaven gift us with the holy spirit through a rushing wind and flaming tongues of fire just so that jesus could tell us what to think just so that the gospel could be nothing more than an ancient self-help narrative the gospel is not a list of what to do's and what not to do's the gospel is an orientation in how to be an orientation toward the liberatory and salvific power of god it is not programmed into us like new computer software we wear it like a cloak of anointing better yet it's washed over us like a baptism. It's a who you are rinsing and cleansing of all the world's mess. This gospel is one that is radical, subversive, participatory, and revolutionary. It does not wait for a leader's orders. It will not tell you what to do. It will only remind you of who you are and whose you are. This gospel is yours. This gospel is ours. And it will be the thing that will save us all. It is why we are able to sing so boldly, so powerfully, so strongly on this morning for your glory. I would do anything. It's why we sing so desperately, I wanna be where you are, God. I have to be where you are, and so let this be our response on this day. Let this be our prayer. Let this be how we move in our lives today. So come and see, come and see. Thanks be to God.